Hello, welcome back. It's very good to see you again. I'm so glad that you could join me. So today I'm going to be doing a Q&A. You may have seen earlier in the week, I asked if you could submit your questions for me to answer today. So I've been getting them through all week. I've had some really amazing questions, ones that I've never seen before. Sometimes when you're doing a Q&A and you're asking for questions, you get the same questions again and again and again. This time, completely new questions. I'm so pleased. It's so fun for me to get to answer some new things that people don't know about me. And I just thought that it was a great chance for people who are new subscribers, or even if you've been here for a long time, to learn something more about me that you've not known before. I think in previous Q&As, they've been very focused on uh, design and style and how to do certain things in the house. Also kind of businessy questions or ones about how to uh, grow on YouTube. These ones that I've selected are really quite, not so personal, but you get to know more about me as a person rather than me as a brand. So I thought that would be a great thing to do today. So without further ado, let's get going into the first question. And this is from Gaz Penny. And he said, if you're originally from Birmingham, how come you don't have a Birmingham accent? Okay, so this was something that I wanted to answer today because my accent and questions about it is something that people ask all the time. I get questions on Instagram, I see them in comments here on YouTube, and I know that it's some t in the past it's been discussed on certain forums about my accent, so I thought that it would be a good time for me to sit here and talk about my accent. So as I've said many times in the past when I've talked about my personal life and my background, I've told, I've made it very clear that I'm from Birmingham, the West Midlands in the UK. I grew up there and I left when I was 18. And yeah, there is a very strong accent in that area. And I, in fact, my parents and my family, they all have this strong Birmingham accent. So I used to have that accent too. Now, people always think or accuse me of doing a fake accent. And it's not that simple. So when I was 18 years old, I left Birmingham and I haven't been back there to live since, and I'm 32 years old now. So that is quite a long time of being away. And also, when you live a life of traveling and not being in one particular place, you have to meet a lot of new people, make lots of new friends, connections. And I think what you tend to do is not change your accent on purpose, but you definitely alter your accent so that you can be more clearly understood and so that you feel more uh, like you fit in with a bigger group of people. Now that is not to say that I am bothered about fitting in with a certain type of person. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that, you know, you might, I, for example, for a lot of the time that I moved away from Birmingham, I lived in Dubai. You meet people there from all over the world. There's a huge expat community. And I think, um, you try to speak clearly, slowly, so that people from different parts of the world can understand. Accents are a very difficult thing. Um, one of my best friends in Dubai is from the USA, and she often really struggles with some of the uh, British accents. One of the ones that she really struggles with is the Liverpool accent. She really finds it hard to understand that one and says that it's kind of like a new language. So I was always very aware of making sure that people who I met could understand me. So, of course, I listened to my own accent, tried to make it clear, and tried to speak in a more generic way. And I think over time, that is where my accent started to change. You do notice when you're speaking the certain sounds that give you your accent, and slowly, slowly, you, you can change certain bits, and eventually, they just become the way you speak, which is what has happened to me over the years. I also think that when you're doing stuff like this on camera, um, you, your voice definitely changes without you having any control over it. I'm not sure whether you remember if you're a person who used to have a landline telephone at your house. I know they're virtually non-existent now. But do you remember when your parents would adopt like a telephone voice, that when they answered the phone, they spoke in their best voice? I think that is what tends to happen for me when I'm filming. It's something that I can't really control. It's just that I have to do this kind of polished, more performance voice 
and it's it just I just can't stop it and it's just something that naturally happens for me so this is my probably best version of my voice yes I do probably have hints of a Birmingham accent when I'm speaking to you know my friends in real life and certainly when I go back home to the West Midlands and I'm around all of my friends and family my voice just goes back to the way it used to be so yep this is my voice now it's changed over many years I would say that it was a conscious decision to um, to do that uh, I wanted to be clear I wanted to speak um, concisely clearly to everybody I met and just be have a more general accent so I started to change little things about my voice not because I was embarrassed or ashamed but just because I wanted to have that little clarity in my voice so yeah over the years I've slowly slowly adopted certain ways of saying things and now I speak like this so that is my voice okay so let's move on to the next question yeah okay so this one is really interesting because it's a question that I've been asked quite a lot in the last month or so it is a um, it's, it's a topic that's been in the news a lot recently so obviously a lot of people are following it but for some reason people want to know my opinion about this topic and um, for so I don't know why but they do so the question is from Rosa Rosa Timis did you follow the Depp Heard situation <laughs> Okay, so obviously I am very aware that there's been a thing going on with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. It's been all over the news, it's been all over social media, it's been a really hot topic in our society. But I have to tell you that I am not a person who is really interested in pop culture. I do like various aspects of it, but I'm not somebody who is, you know, religiously following everything that's going on in the world in terms of pop culture and gossip celebrities it's just not my thing it was 10 years ago but I've really um, over the years stopped involving myself in that kind of thing and I'll be completely honest I'm not being ignorant about the news and about what's going on in the world but I don't really know what this Depp Heard situation is Obviously, I know there's a court case and there's been accusations, but I do not know the ins and outs, the details of it, enough to comment on what I believe and what I think is true. Obviously, a judgment has been made in court, so that is the law. Maybe that's wrong, maybe that's right, I don't know. But I personally do not have an opinion about Johnny Depp or Amber Heard and the whole situation. I think <clears throat> since I have been on YouTube, and become more known in the world even in a tiny 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 way I've realized that um, being entertained by people's personal lives especially something that can be quite traumatic like their situation is not a good thing so I don't like to get involved with it I think my entertainment comes from more joyful pleasant wholesome things rather than being entertained by the problems that people are having in their personal lives I think it's a very common thing within our um, current situ our current time in the world we all seem to be obsessed with the lives of people who we don't know and it's kind of it can be entertaining to um, revel in other people's misery and I'm sure that for both of those people Amber and Johnny this has been a horrible situation and to have it blown up in front of the world and have everything um, dissected has not been very nice for either of them regardless of the situation so I didn't follow the Depp Heard situation um, this is not something that I like to do gossip for me is off topic and I would you know it's not really me so no I didn't follow the situation Oh, okay, I've just realized that it's getting very dark in here. We've got a huge rain cloud coming over, so I've just put some lights on. Let's move on to the next question. Okay. Uh, your best and worst your best and worst traits, Nicholas. Okay, so I thought that this was a good question um because it means that I have to be quite honest and evaluate myself. And I think sometimes um on social media and on YouTube you can tend to show the best parts of your life the best parts of your character and 
um, the, the more not so favorable things can be left for real life. So I think it is nice sometimes to be honest and open so that people can get to know you a lot better and just own up to maybe some of the not so good things about your character and personality. So for the best traits, I think in terms of me uh, in my personal life, I'm a kind person who, when I'm friends with someone, I will give them the very best of myself um, and I'm, I'm a very loyal person. So I think that is one of my best traits. I think yeah, when I have a friend or um, maybe a relationship, I do give 100% of myself. I try to be very fair and open with the other person. You know, we all have very different personalities. And I think one of my uh, best skills is identifying um, what makes a person tick, what gets them angry and upset, and just um, altering the way I am to adjust and make them more comfortable. So I think that is a really nice thing about myself that I'm able to adapt and honestly don't mind doing that. It makes me happy to make other people happy and uh, have a nice friendship or relationship that is running smoothly. One of the things that I always say that I want for my life is for it to be um, non-confrontational and kind of peaceful. And some people think that is a bit weak um, and not a good thing to always try to be, you know, pleasing everyone. That is not what I try to do. You know, I will always put my own interests first as well so that I'm not being miserable. But what I've found in my life is that I tend to be happy when I have a group of friends or a relationship with family members as well, that if things are smooth, we can have more fun, life can be better. And especially with all of the rubbish that's going on in the world, if you can just create a life of happiness for yourself, I think that is the best approach, so that is the one that I always choose to take. In terms of my professional life and my life as a business person, I think my best traits is that I'm uh, very uh, ambitious and I have a very creative mind so that I can think about what I want to do. I have, you know, I don't think that anything is unachievable. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a visionary in that way. So I think that I'm good at identifying what I want to do with my life and then making a plan to put it into action. And I think I am quite good at doing that. So I can think about maybe in the next five years, for example, I want to buy a house. So what do I need to do in the next year, the next two years, the next week to start building towards that goal? I think that is one of the things that I'm particularly good at. Also, um, with some creative people, they can be, they can have the best ideas and then not really know how to um, see them through. So they'll start really, really uh, enthusiastically at the beginning of a project. And then when things don't start to happen or it's taking longer than expected, they give up. I think the one thing that I'm good at is, for example, with my candle, I knew that I wanted to have that about three years ago. And so once I started to actually work on it, even though there were lots of stumbling blocks and it was a bit difficult at times, eventually I had my own candles. So that is another thing that I think I am good at, is identifying what I want for my life and just being able to make it happen. And that is not to say that I do that on my own. Um, I would not be able to do most things without my business partner, who I talk about all the time, Vanessa. She is also somebody who is exceptionally talented in just getting things done. So I think I'm good at also um, finding people who will come into my life and improve it and so that we can improve our lives together. And I think that is um, a lovely thing to do, to bring people into your life and help each other to build the life of your dreams. And I think that um, that is something that I'm very, very grateful for. I think and in terms of my personal life, maybe a, a bad trait is that I can be selfish in terms of if I've identified a way that I want to live my life, I will do that and not really, it's a hard thing to say, not disregard, but um, how do I say, for example, all of my family live in, in Birmingham. I knew from a very young age that I didn't want to live there. 
So when I was 18, I left and I've never moved back. Now, they're all very close. I have a niece and I've shown you uh, a few weeks ago, my sister's building a beautiful house and they're probably all going to live together. And they miss me a lot and I miss them. And they always ask me, why don't you move back? Why don't you move back? And because I don't want to live in that place, um, I would never move back, even though I do miss my family and I know that my niece misses me, she's only four, and I'm missing out on a lot of memories and things. I just think that this is my life and um, it's not really, it's not my decision to live in that area, so I'm not gonna move back and satisfy all of those desires and needs um, when I know what I want to do. So maybe that is selfish, I don't know. And maybe in a few years, I will regret uh, not being there and missing out on things. But I just think that I know what kind of life I want to have and I need to be in a certain place to do it. So that I think is probably not the best trait, but I do have to think about my life and um, what I want to achieve. And maybe I'll, I'll be thankful for that as well. I don't know. I don't know whether it's a good or bad thing. A lot of people would say it was bad. So actually, this brings me on to the next question, and this is by P. L. Crocker, and it says, why do you live in Edinburgh? Your family is far away. So I've basically just touched on that, that, yeah, my family is far away, and I live uh, quite a few miles away in Edinburgh. So yeah, let me give you a little background about why I'm here in Edinburgh. So when I was 21 years old, I met my previous boyfriend and we were together for eight years, almost nine. And um, so I'd already moved away from home at that point when we met. But when we met, he was working in Dubai. He, we'd been together for a few months and he, he asked me to go and uh, have a holiday with him there. So it was only supposed to be for two weeks. I had a job, a full-time job, and um, at the end of the two weeks, we decided that I would stay in Dubai and start my own career from scratch. So that, to cut a long story short, that's what I did. That's how I became, got to this point in my life now, doing this. Now, as you probably know about Dubai, it is a very hot country, and in the summer months, it is quite a difficult place to live because it's so, so hot. In fact, a lot of the locals and people who live there will go for summer vacations in Europe to escape the heat. And that is what we used to do. So we had a holiday home on the east coast of Scotland, which is about 30 miles away from Edinburgh. We had that for three years. And so when we were living there in the summertime, we would often come into Edinburgh to shop and go to restaurants, the movies and stuff. So we got to know Edinburgh quite well. And, uh, then we moved to the Cotswolds, which was, which was something that I wanted to do because that was not so far from my family, which I really enjoyed. And then when we came to making the final decision about where we wanted to live, he really wanted to live in Edinburgh. And because the Cotswolds was very nice, um, but a little bit sleepy for our lives, and I wasn't really meeting people, making friends, I let him decide where we would live next, and he wanted to live in Edinburgh. Now, I'll be completely honest, I did not want to move back to Scotland, even though I'd enjoyed my time there living in a house on the east coast by the sea. I found it quite sleepy. Um, it, it's obviously very, very far from my own family and friends, and I didn't know one person in Edinburgh. Also, the weather is not the best here. It can be, it's often 10 degrees cooler in Edinburgh than the rest of the UK, especially in London. So all of these things were my reasons for not wanting to move. But we kind of had a quick, we had to make a quick decision. It was coming up to Christmas time. And so we decided that we would move to Edinburgh. So that's, his, that's what we did. Uh, and I decided to try to make the best of it. And funnily enough, it worked out very well. When we decided to break up, he moved away from Edinburgh and I decided to stay here um, on my own. And by that time, I'd established a network of friends. Uh, I'd started my own business. And so things were going very well for me here. So I just decided to stay. Now I've decided that I'm probably gonna spend the next few years here in Edinburgh because I run my business from here. I've got a network of friends here, like I just said, and I think to achieve the next stage of my life, I need to stay focused and moving house would be a bit of a bump in the road and would knock me off my goals and things that I need to achieve 
in the next few years. So certainly for the next few years, I'm going to be staying in Edinburgh. Um, but to be honest, I don't see myself staying here for the long term. Uh, for all of the reasons that I said before, it's quite far from family, even though that's not a huge thing uh, factor in my life because it's very easy to travel. It takes me like 45 minutes on a plane to see them. Um, but it is, it is further than I would like. The weather is a huge thing for me. Uh, weather uh, affects me greatly. When the sun shines and it's warm, I feel a lot happier, uplifted. Here it rains quite a lot, it's windy, and in the winter months it's often dark for most of the day. Uh, I've also been spending quite a lot of time in London. Uh, Vanessa and her partner have got a house in London, so we get to stay with them. And when I go to London, it is always a great exercise. Um, I often meet new people, make different connections, and things really happen there. You, I think you have to be either in London or close to London if you really want to build a brand and keep going to the next step in your life. Now, I would not be able to afford London, definitely not in the next five years. I, if I wanted to live there in my current situation, I'd have to have uh, a house that would not be, it would not be able to be filmed on YouTube. It would have to be a shared house. It would be in a bad location. So for me at this moment, London is not an option, but I'm able to go there because Vanessa's house is there as well. And so I can visit there quite a lot and get the things done that I need to do. Maybe in the next five years, I'll be able to move to an area like an hour outside of London where I can just get the train uh, into London. But for now, I'm gonna stay in Edinburgh. I like it here. Uh, I've got friends and it's fun. So it's definitely where I'm gonna stay, but I'm not gonna be here for the rest of my life. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Do you miss anything about a non-YouTube job like when you did interior design for a living? It's something that I often think about. So I haven't really talked about my past life in, in my career. So I left school when I was 18 years old and I was going to go to university. I met a guy and he was a little bit older than me. He was seven years older than me and we were very in love and he convinced me to uh, give uni a miss for one year because we were in a relationship and obviously we didn't want to separate from each other. So we both decided that it was best if I just had a gap year. And so when I was at school at age 18, I got a part-time job whilst I was still uh, doing education, where I worked in a clothes store called Next. That is quite a famous high street retail store in the UK. And I used to work there four hours every evening from four to 8 p.m. And then when uh, I left, when I finished school and I was gonna go to uni, I decided not. Uh, I decided to work full-time there. So I got a promotion and I was a manager at uh, Next for about two years. And you know, that was a very hard job. It was long hours, it was antisocial. For people who don't know about Next, it's a big high, high street retailer and every Christmas and summertime they have a huge sale, which is quite famous here, where everything's like up to 70% off. And this always happens on the 26th of December. So that means that Christmas, as when you're a Next employee is not the best time. For the whole run up to Christmas, it is insanely busy. You work long hours and then you get Christmas day off and then you're back into work at 5 a.m., which is when the sale starts, 5 a.m. in the morning. On the day after Christmas day is literally the worst. You cannot enjoy Christmas day because you're constantly thinking, oh, tomorrow I'm working. I've got to go to bed early. You can't have a drink. It really, really ruins Christmas. So I, despite that, I actually did enjoy that job. It was kind of a creative role where I did a lot with merchandising and I really liked clothes and fashion. I worked in the, first I worked in the menswear and then I worked in ladies wear, which I enjoyed more. The menswear was kind of a bit uh, stale and the merchandising was very uniform, you know, just put t-shirts here, jeans there. Whereas with ladies wear, you can create proper outfits, which I enjoyed. 
So yeah, it was a hard job, long hours, antisocial, but I enjoyed that job a lot. Uh, it gave me a lot of creativity. I got to meet members of the public, and I think it really gave me a lot of confidence. Just meeting people every day, having to deal with situations. So that was my first job. And then when I decided that I was tired of the antisocial hours, I just thought, what can I do to only work Monday to Friday, nine to five? So I managed to get myself an office job, um, which is probably a mistake because it was the most boring, long job ever. And I was really bad. It was, a, it was a, a largely based on the telephone, so I had to answer lots of phone calls and advise people about orders and things like that. And every month, at the end of the month, we had to sit in with the boss and listen to uh, our previous phone calls. We, five phone calls, for example, were selected at random. We had to listen to them and just see how well we'd done them. And this was always like a complete nightmare for me because it was always so bad. It was always so embarrassing. I was just so, so bad at this job. And uh, yeah, it was sitting there listening to my self doing a bad job was excruciatingly embarrassing so not the best move for me and that was the last job that i had before i met my previous partner who i just talked about and then moved to dubai and then from then it was um it was me just deciding what i want to do and then gradually starting my own business. I did a bit of interior design, and then now I have my own company called Nicholas Fairford, where I make YouTube videos and sell my own products on nicholasfairford.com. So that was telling you all about that. So do I miss anything about a non-YouTube job? I think what I miss the most is, uh, well, I miss and don't miss the structure of working in a set environment, so having to be there at 9 a.m. and leaving at 5. I miss that, but I also don't miss it at all, actually. Um, I actually prefer deciding when I want to work and having that responsibility of, you know, if I don't do the work, then nobody else will do it, and then it will be me who suffers. So, yeah, I, I, I do miss it in a way because it means that I have, you know, you have a set life, a set routine, but it's also very nice just to live life on your own terms and be your own boss. So let's move on to the next question. This is from HJ Jones 21 and it says, Hi Nicholas, we know you're currently single, um, but what are you looking for in your next relationship? I thought this was a good question to answer because one of the questions that I got asked the most was if I am single and yes, I am. I've been single for about two years. Um, and I think I do, I do want a relationship. It is something that uh, is a priority in my life at the minute, in my personal life. Obviously, I've got a lot of ambitions and goals in my professional life, which I'm working on. But in my personal life, I really am ready for a relationship. Um, I feel like I'm in a good place in my life to give the best of myself in a relationship. And I think that somebody entering my life now would fit well in the rest of my life and would be very complementary to the life that I'm living now. So I definitely would love to have a relationship, but it has to be the right type of relationship. Now, here in Edinburgh, I'll be completely honest, I go out most weekends, I go often to the local gay club and I meet people there, but it just seems that there isn't really a desire for people here to have a long-term relationship. Maybe I'm just going to the wrong places, but yeah, I tend to meet people, there's a bit of a connection, and then it becomes clear that a, a relationship is not what they're looking for, so to speak. So yeah, I haven't really met anybody here um, in that way. The next best way to meet people really, I think, is through dating apps and websites, which I am on. But it is a very, it hasn't been a very successful way for me to meet people so far. Firstly, and this is what I hear from everybody who's on these apps, whether you're straight, gay, bisexual, whatever, what I hear from everyone, uh, no matter whether who you are, is that it's a real hard experience to use these apps because what tends to happen is you match with people, you either never get a conversation going or when you do, it lasts for a few days, it fizzles out. It seems that nobody really wants to make the effort to meet and have a relationship. So 
I have not met anybody through an app yet where it's been something special or long term. And I think that has been an experience for a lot of my friends as well. So I don't know what is wrong with with people. Why don't you want to have a relationship? Let me know. <laughs> but yeah, seriously, when I think about what I want for a relationship, I've thought about this quite a lot. It's um, it's I do have a clear picture in my head of what I'm looking for, not in terms of looks, um, more in terms of what I want to work in my life. Now, what I always say is that. I want somebody who can sit with me on a Friday night when I go to my best friend's house with her and her partner and what we do is we tend to order food, have a cocktail, then a bottle of wine and we sit and we chat for hours and hours and hours and then we might walk to the pub and have a drink there. And I always say that I want somebody to fit into that uh, situation and just fit completely naturally and just be one of us. I think that is very important because it will tell me a lot about the person and if they fit into that life and can comfortably sit there then that is really ticking a lot of the boxes and oftentimes when I'm dating someone or there's a potential person who I might like I think can I imagine them at the table and often it's no and it may be various different things I don't know small things but I just don't think it I just can't imagine it working now, in previous relationships, I've ignored that uh, desire and that um, that requirement in a person and it has always ended up being a bad decision. I think when you compromise on those sorts of things, like somebody being social when you are or um, someone, if, if you're a very outgoing person who enjoys going to parties and they're not and you think, oh, maybe it could work, often it doesn't really work unless you're looking for someone who doesn't really get involved with your life and you want to live separate lives. So that is probably the biggest requirement for me. It's a very good indication of whether I'm gonna like somebody or not and can see it's working. Can they sit at the table on a Friday and be comfortable and enjoy themselves? That is a huge thing. In terms of personality and looks, I would like to have somebody who is emotionally intelligent somebody who is not serious i can't bear serious people i want somebody who's really fun enjoys life likes to do fun things i want somebody who is intelligent somebody who is kind somebody who is thoughtful so yeah probably all of the things that most people are looking for uh, and then in terms of looks i tend to go for pretty much a set type but this is not set in stone. So if somebody is considering emailing me to offer me a date, don't be put off by me saying that I'm looking for a certain type of man. I'm not. I think in the past I've said that I want this kind of man and I've ended up dating someone for two years who's been completely the opposite and we've had the best time. So it's not set in stone. But generally I tend to be attracted to taller guys who have a uh, sporty build, dark hair, um, that's it. So tall, dark, handsome. Pretty much what everybody's looking for, I guess. <laughs> no, but yeah. Uh, yeah, that is the ideal in terms of what I'm looking for. But honestly, it's more about the person and whether we click. It's all about connection. So really, uh, it's a very cliche thing to say, but I'm not that interested in the way that someone looks. It's more about, will they fit into my life? Uh, will I fit into their life, which is also very important, and can we have a fun, happy life together? So that is what I'm looking for in my next relationship. So this Q&A is getting very long. Um, I like to answer questions in detail, so I don't want this to go on and on and on. I realise that it might be becoming boring, so I think we're going to end things there. So before I go, I thought that I would announce the winner of the mugs. I completely picked these two people at random just by scrolling through the comments, stopping and putting my finger on the screen. So the first one is going to Farah Alamgir and the second one is going to Caroline McDonald. So congratulations. If you still want to be with the chance of winning a mug, check out my Instagram tomorrow where I'm going to be telling you how you can do that. It's going to be, again, very simple. You won't really have to do a lot to win the mug. So yeah, check my Instagram tomorrow where I'll be giving two more people the chance to win a mug. 
Well, I really hope that you have enjoyed this Q&A, found it fun and interesting. For me, it was and always is. I so enjoy doing this with you and just opening up a little bit more. Look forward to seeing you next week. But until then, enjoy the rest of your week and take care. Bye-bye.